Welcome to Free Thoughts. I'm Aaron Powell. And I'm Trevor Burris. And joining us today is William Irwin. He's professor of philosophy at King's College in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. And he's creator of the philosophy and pop culture series of books, including Seinfeld and Philosophy and The Simpsons and Philosophy, both of which he edited. And back in August 2016, we had him on Free Thoughts to talk about his book, The Free Market Existentialist, Capitalism Without Consumerism. Welcome back to Free Thoughts. Well, thanks for having me back, guys. Pleasure to be with you. So today we're going to we're going to break the first and second rules of Fight Club because we're going to talk about Fight Club. Uh, I'll start with is is Fight Club and I guess we should sometimes the the movie and the novel are a little bit different in how they approach these things. So we should also have a, a thing at the beginning if you have not seen or read Fight Club spoilers. at the beginning of this episode like there will be spoilers that you probably don't want so you should probably go read it. And watch it and then come back and listen. Yes, you've been warned. So is Fight Club anti-consumerism or is it anti-anti-consumerism? Well, there you go, right? Uh, and as you know, there are some differences between the uh, the novel uh, and the film. And I, I think one that, that's pertinent uh, to the question you ask is that the movie, I think, is more anti-consumerism than, uh, than the book is. And uh, it, it's sort of ironic in, in that the uh, the movie itself, of course, is a consumer product, and uh, lots of uh, big companies, including uh, Coke, uh, not Coca Cola, but uh, by Pepsi, Krispy Kreme, Starbucks, seem to have uh, paid big money to uh, have product placement in what at least seems to be an anti-consumerist movie. But I mean, it's it's also it's pretty extreme, and we I mean to the point of mass destruction, at least in the movie, and I mean also in the book, which could be seen as, as sending up the, the kind of miss the I guess the aims of the kind of at the time it came out, we had the WTO was about to happen. Some of the kind of uh, anonymous were going to break stuff, the uh, Adbusters magazine, stuff like this had come out. But I mean it could be seen as parroting exactly what they do for just how how extreme this is and how silly it gets. Yeah, that, I mean, that, that is a good point. Uh, it's certainly, uh, in the end, when Fight Club morphs into Project Mayhem, it, it's totally gone off the rails. It moves from uh, a kind of uh, uh, issue of self-discovery with these guys, how well can you really know yourself if you haven't been in a fight, and discovering your individuality and breaking free, to then the, uh, the first rule of Project Mayhem is you don't ask questions about Project Mayhem. And so these people are acting uh, basically like uh, like drones, following the uh, the leadership of Tyler Durden and uh, and uh, breaking up, uh, blowing up buildings and all the kind of mindless uh, violence and mindless uh, anti-consumerism uh, that uh, that you mentioned. And it, it, it's a good point and a reference maybe for listeners that. Uh, the uh, the movie goes back to 1999, so uh, you, you said it nicely in uh, in its historical context just before. Well, that was that was one of the interesting differences I think between the movie and book is that the movie, the the big plan is to blow up the credit card companies and wipe out consumer debt, but the book it's just to blow up a big building and I think knock it over on top of a museum. Um, so the movie seems to take that that notion and run with it even more. Uh, much more, I think. Yeah, I mean that that really is the way that it that it's framed uh, in the movie, and so I, I think it, it takes on a sort of victim mentality, uh, whereas the the characters start off trying to discover themselves and break free from uh, the way in which they've been conformist and sort of uh, become uh, Ikea boy and uh, this nesting instinct and kind of metrosexual uh, concern with clothing and appearance and all of that uh, to then uh, blaming it. Well, why am I this way, right? Instead of saying I'm responsible for the way that I've become because I've bought into uh, media portrayals or just conformed uh, to the way in which people are living around me. Instead of saying that, uh, the finger gets pointed at the corporations, uh, Gucci and Calvin Klein, who are selling them a lifestyle, or Ikea, or Starbucks, or whatever else. Uh, and really, all those, those corporations have done, uh, have made available certain products uh, that uh, you're free to, uh, to choose to indulge in or not. If, if this was to be considered an existentialist book, um is that change from self-discovery 
like the idea of having a fight club just so you can you can experience what it's like to be hit and feel and feel different emotions feel in danger how that could be beneficial to you changing from self discovery to we're going to change the whole world order and we're going to blame as you said ourselves on those other people, the corporations and whatnot, um, is that does that make it not existentialist when it makes that shift when it goes from self responsibility to let's go blow stuff up because they did this to us? I, I would certainly so, say so, but what part of the irony uh, involved in answering that question is that uh, Fight Club starts off as very much an existentialist tale in the sense of uh, the early Jean-Paul Sartre, who has this great emphasis on personal freedom, individual freedom, and with that individual responsibility uh, to the uh, the end part uh, of Fight Club, mirroring the later Jean-Paul Sartre, who uh, embraces Marxism and does not disavow his existentialism. And it's been a constant puzzle uh, ever since how those two could possibly fit together. And my book, Free Market Existentialist, argues that they really can't. Uh, once you start blaming uh, other people rather than taking individual responsibility, uh, the, uh, the existentialist impulse uh, is pretty well gone. I mean, and we can see this uh, if we imagine uh, alternatively the way the characters in Fight Club might have acted. It might not have been as good of a story. It's a great story. I don't critique it uh, as art, but uh, it would have been more existentially satisfying uh, if they took responsibility for themselves uh, and simply spread that message of personal responsibility rather than trying to liberate everybody from their debt that they uh, – I mean when you think of the debt that they want to free everybody from, it's debt that's been incurred by freely making choices to charge crap on their credit cards. Uh, that's not very existentialist, freeing people from responsibility that they themselves should be held uh, accountable for. I, I wonder about the the starting point for it because it seems like they're so we can we can say like their reaction to consumerism and their reaction to where the world had put them and the way the world treated them ultimately goes off the rails, um, but but I wonder if it's on the rails to begin with in a sense that like what's so bad about the situation that our unnamed narrator finds himself in or that these other men find themselves in that that warrants rejecting everything. I mean, he seems he has he has a job, okay, but you know, you need a job even even in the, you know, when he's talking about hunting under the, you know, in the the jungles outside the Rockefeller Center, um that still is a job. You still need to work. Um he seems to have a decent life. He's got I mean, he's got insomnia, um and as someone who has suffered from insomnia before, it's it's terrible. Um it Really sucks, but that's not really you know that it's, it's not a, a product of late capitalism or something that he can't go to sleep. Um, and so are they are they kind of misdiagnosing their situation to begin with, and therefore rejecting modern society and consumerism, not just in a bad way ultimately, but for bad reasons. Well, I, I think certainly that they go overboard uh, in their rejection of it, and, and moderation is called for more than uh, complete rejection, right? Uh, it's as if uh, somebody had one bad meal and decided never to eat again, or to eat, uh, you know, uh, only to the extent that they're they're wasting away, right? Uh, as you suggest in the question, there's lots uh, of good that uh, is on offer. Uh, in the capitalist uh, society in which the uh, the protagonist finds himself living, but he's sort of living in a, a well upholstered uh, hell uh, where he has no actual meaning in his life, and the choices that he's made have not been well considered ones. They've just been. Uh, I mean, this is a guy who uh, who has first world problems, right? That uh, he has no meaning uh, in his very very comfortable and pampered, and uh, some might say privileged life because he really hasn't chosen well. And we, we see this in the, the dialogue between uh, Jack and uh, Tyler Durden, uh, where they're talking about their similarities before the big reveal uh, has come that they're really the same person, right? That their father is an absentee father, uh, that uh, the father said it was important that they go to college, 
then it was important uh, that they get a job. And now they're saying, well, maybe it's important that you get married. But none of these are really self-chosen uh, ideals. And this is the kind of thing uh, that as a, a college professor I see all too often in my students uh, who are choosing a major. They're at a college that their parents told them to come to in the first place, choosing a major that their parents have chosen for them that will lead them into a career uh, that they probably won't really enjoy very much to buy a lot of crap that they really won't enjoy very much after the initial high of having it is gone. Uh, so, I mean, in a way, it's it's hard to feel sorry for these guys, uh, but it's also uh, really not uh, an extreme or unheard of situation that the, the, you know, the protagonist finds himself in. Well, let me see if I can revise the kind of thought I'm – so I guess the question is what's wrong with Ikea um, in, in the sense that – so they he's got he's got these comforts and maybe he's choosing them for the wrong reasons but one of the one of the themes seems to be that there's there's something almost anti existentialist or anti authentic about comfort about wealth about the the being pampered that in order to be truly who you are to be truly authentic you need to i mean the the paper street uh soap company where they live is is an absolute dump um, and and the movie just you know kicks that up a few notches of just it's it's almost a dangerous place to live in terms of the electrical and the falling ceilings and the the water damage everywhere um, that they you know you have to suffer through standing on the porch for three days um, that that having creature comforts of any kind in a sense is is inauthentic which seems. I mean, at least a point that would have to be argued for. Like, is that like why why do we need to reject creature comforts in order to be really who we are or self-defining? Right, right. No, I, I think that that uh, your your question, your point there is, is right on, uh, and it illustrates how they they go too far. I mean, we all know and maybe have been this kind of person, uh, like the uh, the smoker who becomes uh, an anti-smoking zealot, right? Uh, and is knocking cigarettes out of people's hands and, you know, wrinkles his nose at the smell of tobacco, that kind of thing. It goes too far uh, in that direction. Uh, and I don't think from a purely existentialist standpoint, there's anything wrong uh, with IKEA or with uh, taking comforts in certain pleasures or even certain consumer goods so long as they're chosen authentically. So if we think about the way that they uh, they dress at Paper Street where it's just kind of uh, uh, Tyler Durden, Brad Pitt hanging out in that rad, ratty uh, uh, bathrobe and, and clothes like that, it's, it's really stripped down. But, but then also if you think about the initial encounter between Tyler Durden and, and Jack, if we can call him that, the, uh, the protagonist played by Ed Norton uh, on the plane, uh, think about the contrast in the clothes that they're wearing there. Uh, we have Ed Norton wearing his business attire, which he's cultivated a taste for. But then we have uh, the uh, Tyler Durden character wearing a red leather jacket and a collar flung open shirt. Uh, and this, this seems to be more authentically what, what his taste would be uh, if he didn't have to conform to the expectations uh, of the business world. And the red leather jacket and whatever else uh, Tyler Durden is wearing might even be more more expensive uh, than whatever the business attire was, but it seems more authentically chosen. And, and I think that's that's an important corrective uh, and a middle ground that the uh, the movie doesn't realize. And, and if we were to play it out philosophically, that's uh, a place we'd like to see it end up, right? So that you swing back and forth in a kind of Hegelian dialectic of extremes where we have extreme uh, capital, not extreme capitalism, but extreme consumerism and then extreme anti-consumerism. And we find uh, this middle ground where our consumer choices are authentic choices. Of course, that might make for a boring story and movie, uh, but uh, philosophically, uh, it's probably uh, a healthier middle ground. It seems that auth authenticity is – well, I, I, that it's particularly an issue in modern life and I – and this movie kind of stands I think as a – one of the texts that talks about 
authenticity, especially the way we perceive it now. We talk about whether or not someone we keeping it real, whether or not someone is is a, re, is a poser or not. So we had this huge question when. I think it was Avril Lavigne. I apologize to anyone who knows more about this than I do because I don't know much. But there was a thing – there was a video in the early 2000s where she was skateboarding. And then there was a huge like, kerfuffle because they were like, she's not really a skateboarder. She's 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 not authentically a skateboarder. So she's somehow – it's almost like cultural appropriation that they're not being authentic. And it seems like something we might talk about more recently than, than maybe we used to when we were too poor <laughs> maybe to sit around and, and wonder whether or not we were being authentic as, as, a, as a race. Uh, and is that part of the, the question, the way we talk about authenticity now, which is that we, we do it from a position of affluence. So oftentimes what we think of as authenticity is stripping away some of those affluent traits. But maybe when we were relatively poor as a, as a people, tilling the fields and things like that, the view of authenticity could have been flipped around, that what you really needed was a life of leisure where you could contemplate the greater questions of existence. And that it's always, it's not really a thing called authenticity. There's just different viewpoints of kind of what you don't have right now. Yeah, no, that, that, that's a great question. Uh, and it, it certainly is a, a kind of a, a rich person's luxury to worry about authenticity. And, and it's one of those terms that I think has been uh, taken up more and more in, uh, in our discourse and, and dialogue uh, and, and maybe misused, maybe not. Uh, I mean, it, it drives me buggy uh, as someone who considers himself an existentialist to hear talk about the existential threat uh, all the time, whatever that may be, right, of North Korea or whatever it may be, uh, where the real uh, existential threat uh, from uh, the existentialist is that you may be living in a godless, meaningless universe. That's the real thing, not whether or not uh, your existence uh, will continue. Uh, but but in terms of authenticity, I mean that, that's that's a nice example about Avril Lavigne skateboarding uh, and the sort of talk about cultural appropriation as to whether or not uh, certain uh, foods or fashions can be borrowed uh, in a way that really is uh, genuine. And thinking back on the uh, the recent uh, presidential election. Uh, there was lots of uh, talk about uh, authenticity and the problem with Hillary, Hillary Clinton is not uh, being authentic or not even that she was not authentic, but that she was not perceived as authentic. And uh, likewise, uh, talk about Trump and part of uh, what uh, a lot of people did like about him is they at least thought he was uh, authentic, spoke his mind, that sort of thing. Uh, this and, is where I just want to interject with a – Yeah, please. Like, it, it seems – if you use Trump and you use our narrator and Tyler Durden as your examples of authenticity, then is like a, a call it mental illness or mental health issues <laughs> bound up in being authentic. I'm right. so crazy that I don't even know what I'm saying kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I don't necessarily offer them as, as icons of, uh, of authenticity. I'm simply saying that people perceived sure. uh, Trump a, as being authentic. I, I, I wouldn't offer him uh, as an example. Uh, and, and sure, uh, part of the problem with authenticity uh, is it really is about trying to be the real thing, right? But there's no such thing as the real thing. And as soon as you try to be the real thing, you're definitely not the real thing. Uh, Dave Chappelle used to have uh, a great uh, skit on, on his comedy show about keeping it real. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. Uh, I think I remember that one, yeah. I think he titled it, uh, When Keeping It Real Goes Wrong. Uh, you know, and it was it was about Chappelle uh, acting out, uh, you know, the uh, uh, demands of what it means to be an African-American uh, and and how you act and how you respond to white people. And, uh, and uh, when you're consciously trying to do that rather than doing it spontaneously or organically, all you're doing is putting on a show, right? Uh, and the, 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 the skits would uh, just go off the rails where he'd end up uh, acting uh, the tough guy in a place where he wasn't the tough guy or telling off his boss or, or whatever. And, and this, is, uh, this is obviously uh, what can go wrong comically. Uh, and maybe it's what goes wrong. Uh, I mean, there are all kinds of psychological diagnoses we can uh, put upon uh, Tyler Durden, uh, but perhaps – uh, going way too far uh, in the pursuit of being your authentic self 
uh, ends up making you not your authentic self. Well, that that make, you got me thinking about the constructing of image, uh, and maybe what Fight Club, the movie in the book, is one of the things it could be seen as saying is we we spend a lot of time knowing about what other people are doing more than a comparative time. If you lived in a in a school in a small town in Indiana, eighteen thirties, uh, your images of what a real farmer was, or what a real housewife was, or you know any of these sort of uh, things of expectations that are put on. I mean, there are definitely social expectations, but you're not pulling in tons of things from around the world, and definitely not in a social media feed that are conveying to you that real men do X and and real women do Y, or real people who do this do X or Y. And not to say that they're always telling us what we should be, because that's a pretty common narrative. Oh, they're always telling you you have to be this way, but you just didn't even know. And so maybe the, the part of the statement here is that the world that is telling you what is authentic is itself uh, not a very good representation of authenticity. So that he's wrong, that going away from consumerism, that's what we've been told. I mean, I hear that all the time. Being anti-consumer seems to be pretty authentic, seems to be like the, the cool thing to do. So actually, he just misconstrued the entire thing and he took an image that he thought was authentic and it wasn't actually authentic to begin with. Yeah, no, that, I, I think that's right. Uh, th there were fewer options and possibilities, right, living in 1800s in, uh, in a farm town in, uh, in Indiana. So you didn't, you didn't even think about it. I mean, you might have had uh, a sense of, of what it means to be a real man, right? Uh, the kind of uh, image of masculinity that your father or whoever else portrayed and maybe what it meant to be a real Christian or whatever it may be. But uh, there, there weren't a whole uh, – authenticity wasn't itself on sale, right? Uh, and uh, being consciously uh, anti-consumerist – uh, is as inauthentic as being uh, consciously – well, I mean people are very self-congratulatory about these things, right? So I mean uh, whenever I see a Prius on the road and it's it's littered with bumper stickers, I think, man, the, the car itself is a bumper sticker. You don't need <laughs> bumper stickers on that, right? I get it. You're uh, an, envir an environmentalist, right? And Likewise, uh, when somebody is ostentatious in their anti-consumerism, uh, they have lost any semblance of what authenticity would be in relation to uh, anti-consumerism. So it's a very di difficult balance and maybe it's one uh, that's impossible to fully achieve for any real period of time, being uh, anti-consumerist and authentic about one's anti-consumerism. Has Consumerism or I guess the the form of market economy that, that enables consumerism been instead kind of a boon to authenticity? Um, it, in a sense, there's there's the line in Fight Club about you know our stuff like your stuff owns you um, and that that's – there's something wrong with that and it gets this kind of line of causation where your stuff and the the um, quest for more of it and the right kind of it ends up defining you as a person. But it feels like, you know, I mean, at some level, it's hard to define what authenticity means or being really you. But at some level, bound up in it um, and central to it is is the ability to express yourself, to have a means to express who you are. And so we can do that through our language, we can do that through our actions, but we also do that through the things that markets make available to us. So it's not that, you know, he's the the line where he's trying to find like what dining set defines me as a person. It's more like what dining set expresses the person that I am or what music or what set of clothes as Tyler Durden is doing. And so I I wonder if the very fact of pushing against consumerism and then pushing against markets and then pushing into this primitivism where you know you wear so they say in the um, I think it's in the book that you know these you're going to have these leather clothes that are going to last you for the rest of your life and presumably everyone's wearing the same leather clothes that that this push in fact makes it harder to enable actual self-expression and actual authenticity because we've taken away so many of the channels by which we can express who we really are. Well, I mean, th that's it. When when energy and, and time uh, is is consumed by chasing consumer products, then 
we, we lose uh, emphasis on things we'd rather uh, and more authentically express ourselves through, right? So, I mean, it, it's just ridiculous the kind of things uh, that the uh, the protagonist, call him Jack, uh, is interested in, right? What kind of dining set defines me as a person, right? Well, it, it's possible for a 30-year-old male to authentically have that uh, that thought, but it's it's also pretty odd and pretty ridiculous. Uh, and we, we, we get the uh, inter, in the uh, dialogue with uh, with Jack and Tyler Durden, uh, where he's asking, do you know what a duvet is, right? And, oh, it's a comforter, right? Yeah, but I mean, why does a guy like me, a 30-year-old single male, know what uh, a duvet is in the first place, right? I mean, it seems kind of ridiculous. I mean, uh, sure, uh, it's not that it's by default necessarily inauthentic. Maybe uh, some guys really do genuinely like uh, uh, dining room tables and uh, bed linens and things like that, but it but it seems like uh, you know they've been led uh, into a realm uh, of desiring things they really wouldn't want uh, if they could uh, free themselves from it. Uh, I mean, it, it it's like the importance of of sort of second order desires and second order choices, right? It's fine to have the desire and fine to have the option and fine to even want something. Uh, but you need to ask yourself, do I want to want it? Right? So, uh, here, if, if we think of consumerism, not, not, it's not necessarily that consuming and wanting things uh, is a problem. It's the ism, right? And it's the similarity between, say, alcoholism and consumerism. It's fine to want uh, a beer, as they do in the movie and, uh, and in the book, but uh, the problem is when uh, you have no real uh, desire for it, and yet you find yourself drinking anyway, right? When you don't have the desire, but the desire has you, I suppose. What do you think the relationship is between views of authenticity and political beliefs? Because I thought, I thought a lot about this because people use that word in a lot of different policy areas that I, that I sort of operate in as, as, a, as a policy analyst. And, uh, and I hear, I understand that one's view of what a human being, an authentic human being is really, and I'm putting these in scare quotes, an authentic human being is really like, affects your views of policies to some degree. And so, for example, I, one of the things I do here at Cato is, is some Second Amendment policy and firearms policy. And I think that a, a lot of people have a view, if you view humans as inherently violent, for example, as authentically violent, then you might be wary about giving people guns to carry around on their hips because you think it would make – it would perpetuate that violence. It would kind of – because civilization teeters on the edge of collapse and then guns would, would kind of make this happen. Whereas if you view people as authentically cooperative, then maybe you'd have a different view about guns. Or in the campaign finance realm, when you have people criticizing corporate speech and Citizens United, I often tell people that it's not – the the views against Citizens United and corporations spinning in elections are not wildly different than that guy you knew in high school who said, well, yeah, because like the corporate radio stations, they tell you that you like have to listen to Lady Gaga and so you're all listening to that because the corporations are telling you that. And that's what they think pe – how people form political beliefs too. So there's this, this sort of weird mix of authenticity where every single side in ideology has an implicit theory of authenticity that maybe affects some of their views. Sure, I, I think that's the case. If you think that there is a, a human nature that tilts in one direction or another, uh, that certainly is going to influence the uh, the policies that you endorse, the politics uh, that you have. So, uh, there was a book uh, published about a year ago, I, I suppose, called "Fishing for Fools" by a couple of economists uh, who basically. Uh, think of all of us as suckers and easily led around by our desires all the time. And the the example that they use and come back to over and over again is the uh, the Cinnabon stand at the mall or at the the airport, where I mean, there's all this kind of great 
uh, science behind the way they position it and uh, and how they uh, how they market it and uh, you know we're just suckers uh, like uh, people who fall for a phishing scam uh, through email every time we walk by uh, a Cinnabon right uh, and so th their their view of human nature is very much that that we're, we're really out of control that we don't have very much chance of controlling our desires we don't even realize what they are uh, my own view on things is that, well, listen, uh, sure, when, when, I, when I smell the Cinnabon, I want a Cinnabon, but uh, I also want to not want the Cinnabon, right? I don't want to endorse that desire. And I think that people uh, really have much more of a chance to, uh, to endorse their second order desires, right? Where I can recognize what I uh, want to want and don't want to want and, and put that into, into play. Uh, and, you know, in, in the realm of policy and, and politics, uh, as you mentioned, uh, I mentioned Hillary and, uh, and Trump before, but, uh, I mean, you'd have a hard time finding anyone uh, in, in the, uh, the realm of politics who would really be comfortable uh, as describing as, as genuine and authentic. But I think probably in the recent election cycle, Bernie Sanders was the one who was most authentic and, and probably the person... I liked much, although I had the least in common with in terms of my political orientation. I think on the Cinnabon, I mean, part of the reason that all those things work is because when it comes down to it, the Cinnabon is authentically delicious. <laughs> and so, <laughs> Paid for by I, Cinnabon. Yeah, I, I mean, they're, they're good. Really ads now. No, we're we're, we're a non-profit. The Cinnabon, if you would like to send me money, I'll take it. But, um, but on this, one of the things that you bring up and you sent us a, a couple of essays that um, we, can, we can link to in the – Show notes um, on on Fight Club, but one of in one of them you mentioned so this this notion like it begins in anti-conformity. Like the problem is conformity is all these men conforming to social rules and a certain expectation of what masculinity means, um, and and so they turn radically anti-conformist. But then quickly that that radical anti-conformity turns into just as radical like collectivist. Conformity. Um, so Project Mayhem and the the space monkeys when they start showing up, um, all dress the same, all act the same, don't ask questions. And this seems to be a a pretty common thing in in our experience that that movements that begin in anti conformity end up adopting their own extremely strict sets of rules and then punishing people who deviate from them. Um, we see this and I mean, you, you can see it kind of play out in like the, the forms of campus activism right now of we're going we're gonna to stand up to the societal structures. We're going to break with the expectations of racism, sexism and so on and so forth but quickly has become like the, the worst form of um, shame-based and calling out conformity. Is this – is this almost like an inevitable turn? Is there something in the drive for anti-conformity that makes it susceptible to or pushes it in that direction of becoming collectivist conformity? Quite, quite possibly. And, and uh, as mentioned before, there, there's a kind of a, a Hegelian movement with it, right, where uh, an idea meets its opposite. And, and hopefully, uh, in the end, uh, the two come together and you find some reasonable middle ground. But we see too often, and, and in terms of, for example, campus politics and shouting down speakers, et cetera, at, at this historical moment, we see an extreme ugly uh, opposite. And I mean, you can think of this uh, going back to the Avril Lavigne uh, uh, example, or you can think in terms of uh, different fashions or different kind of music, right? I mean, think of punk uh, as uh, kind of a rejection uh, of mainstream music and mainstream fashion. And then, uh, there, you know, you, you move pretty quickly from authentic punk into very inauthentic punk where uh, it's specified as to what will actually count as punk and what will not. And of course, you have all the permutations on that with uh, faux punk uh, and portrayal of uh, certain stances and views and music as being punk that really is nothing uh, like punk. And, uh, you know, in, in my mind, not to get too far off on, on that tangent, I think punk happened once. Uh, in the 1970s, and and you can't go back to it. 
Mm. I, I, I would, I, I would disagree with that. He sees the punk rock fan more than I. Uh, yeah. But but I I, 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 I agree with the eighties and think. into the nineties, and it still exists today. But okay, there's one punk album, Ramones, Ramones. <laughs> no, there's there's more than that. <laughs> That's it. Sorry, Aaron, you're wrong on this one. But sorry, continue <laughs> on on the uh, authenticity. Well, I, the thing I wanted to kind of tie on to that too is something Aaron and I were discussing before we were recording, which is. The alt-right and the Trump world seem to be pretty related to the Fight Club narrative quite before their time. I mean the, the term snowflake that gets kicked around a lot today I think actually comes directly from Fight Club. It, it certainly is used in Fight Club. That's that, And I noticed that in, in just re-watching the film lately. I, I wonder if it got picked up from there. I want to say I have read somewhere, yeah. um, which I know is a, a bad way to – do scholarship, <laughs> but I want to say I read somewhere that that's that that's where the term. I mean, yes, the term for snowflake itself does not originate there, but using snowflake in that way comes from Fight Club. Right, right, yeah. Well, I mean, there's something really disturbing about that and the sort of paramilitary look uh, of the uh, of a lot of the alt right folks. And uh, I mean, if you were to parody, uh, if you were to imitate anything in Fight Club. Uh, the uh, the sort of space monkeys uh, look and the uh, Project Mayhem behavior is really not what you would want to imitate. But you're right; there's something disturbingly similar about the feel and, and the look and the vibe uh, that you get off a lot, of a lot of uh, alt right folks uh, that is resonant of that part of Fight Club. Well, especially the 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 view of masculinity, I think, is is important there because it's all men. Except for Marla, I guess, in Project Mayhem, correct? Do they ever say that there are any women? No, there's no women. Yeah, so uh, – and they're – they feel in the, somehow uh, emasculated in the, by the women. very bad graphic novel follow-up, Fight Club 2, that was published a year or so ago, there are women in, 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 Project in the Mayhem. expanded Project Mayhem. But, but then – but the question about men feeling that they don't have a role in the world, that their unique contribution in terms of ability to to do violence, for example, has been taken out of progress as it's now construed. And so men are looking for a place to fight, kill, those kind of things. And that's what, what Tyler Durden and Project Mayhem eventually bring to them. That there are similarities there with with uh I would say the Trump movement. Uh, I think that's very true. And one of the uh uh, kind of comic ironies of that is is one of the ways. It's not what Chuck Palahniuk himself really had uh, intended, but one of the ways that uh, that Fight Club has been interpreted uh, as a is as a homoerotic uh, novel. And so, really, what they're doing is fucking and not fighting. Uh, if you if you read it that way, and that that's not something uh, that would be very appealing to the alt right folks, I'm sure. I've encountered that interpretation, and I think that's a that's a valid, definitely a valid one. Um, There's also, I mean, to with the the alt right and kind of the the men's rights movement um, online. There's Fight Club also seems to have a blame the women angle to it a bit. Um, so we get the discussion that you know, there's these are men, our our fathers are absent. Um, then he says like we're a generation of men raised by women and then asks like if getting married, if a wife is, you know, is a good next step. Um, and Marla Singer seems to be – I mean she kind of is the the savior at the end in a sense. Um, but through most of it, she's the – you know, she doesn't belong here. She's not part of this. She doesn't get it. Um, that, that that angle seems to be picked up on too in the – you know, we see like there was that, that shooting in um, – California. I think it was San Bernardino or Santa Cruz. Santa, yeah. Santa Cruz. Um, where he, it's this notion that you know I can't. That the problem is women. That you know I can't get. In this case, I can't get a girlfriend. Um, and that's the fault of women and the fault of feminization of society, um, as opposed to. And it goes back to that, you know, that kind of victimization that you mentioned. You know, that they're they're mistakenly. You know, they're blaming everything but themselves for the position that they're in. And so, I mean, it seems obvious if you can't get a girlfriend, the problem is you, it's not women. Um, but but that angle seems picked up too. And it's part of – like I think one of the striking things about rereading is I, I reread the novel for this conversation. I rewatched the movie. Is These came out – the movie's 1999. The novel is either 94, 96. I can't remember which. 96. 96. Uh, is how – 
most prescient these are is how much Fight Club has become kind of part of the culture and you can see aspects of it at play. Like I think you could you make the argument that it's certainly maybe one of the more more most important texts of the late twentieth century as far as talking about where we are today in the twenty first century. Well, yeah, I think it, it's held up uh, incredibly well and uh, uh, even, as you suggest, been a bit prescient in, the, in that way. Uh, and, and you're right. I mean, there is something very strange about the uh, the maleness uh, of it all. I'm, I'm not sh so sure uh, that things are blamed on, on women uh, in, in the film or the book so much as w women aren't the answer, right? So I'm not going to get married. There's never really ever any mention of the of the character's mother. It's just that the father uh, is absent. But but that message that a woman isn't the answer can easily be taken on uh, and saying uh, that women aren't important or women don't matter or women are just kind of scenery or window dressing or accompaniment and and you surely do see that attitude uh, taken on and and it was. Uh, Really taken on in, in horrific and tragic effect by the uh, but was it San Bernardino the, Santa, the Santa Cruz I believe Santa Cruz San mm -hmm. Bernardino was was different right uh, our colleague our colleague Brink Lindsay wrote a book uh, Age of Abundance came out about ten ten years ago maybe um, but in that book he he discusses the evolution of of post war life as sort of a, a movement of people who suddenly have all of their their basic needs covered in America, specifically that they know where their shelter is. They know most people know where they're going to get food, they're going to get water, and so on Maslow's hierarchy, they've they've got that covered. And then the, so then they have to move up to these next realms of spiritual and personal fulfillment as methods of living their lives. And so post war is defined by you have the sort of Christian right emerging, and you have the left emerging with two different theories about how to achieve fulfillment. This seems to me to be part of the entire story we're talking about here, that we have two different groups looking for authenticity, looking for meaning in life in different ways. And in terms of the political realm, they're, they're often at odds with each other and they're trying to control each other while they're living in an incredibly affluent world and have different, entirely different interpretations of what keeping it real to make it just mm -hmm. a very colloquial – entirely of interpretations about what the good life is, what you should be striving for in life, not necessarily either one of them being incorrect, but maybe not very good for everyone in a country trying to kind of enforce that upon everyone else. Right. I mean delivering an answer in any form uh, is not going to suit everyone, right? And there's the line I can't quote quite exactly uh, in the film about uh, – uh, we, our generation has no great war, no great depression, right? Our great war is uh, is a spiritual war. Our great depression is our lives, right? So it, it's this uh, sense of being really comfortable uh, as opposed to a pre-industrial uh, way of living and, uh, and, and not having to struggle, not having a war to fight. Uh, and so searching out for one, uh, and, you know, I, I, I see this in, in all kinds of, uh, of little ways. Uh, I take my dog for a walk with my son and, and the dog loves to find crap on the, uh, the sidewalk. If he can find something to eat there, he's much happier with that than any kind of food that we give him. He's got this whatever foraging, uh, instinct in that way. And I, and I see my son playing video games for hours and hours uh, upon end, I'm not a video game uh, guy myself, but you know I, I see what he's doing. You know, there's there's no real uh, conflict uh, in his life, and he's seeking out uh, the kind of uh, conflict or hero's journey uh, online in these uh, in these games that he plays. And I I don't think that's an altogether bad thing. We need to have some sort of outlet for it, and uh, the fantasy outlet of video games. You know, there there could be worse. So long as you're in touch with your uh, your real life and don't end up living uh, all of your life in the video game, but I mean the the consumerism uh, that is the bad guy in Fight Club could as easily be uh, today what we see with so many people living so much of their lives online, whether it's in video games uh, or or some other kind of fora where they kind of lose sense of a pursuit of uh, of an authentic self outside of that. So why is I mean, Fight Club is certainly not the only 
instance of kind of making this argument and it's a rather common one and, and we see a lot today that – why is it that notions of authenticity and specific – like masculinity and male – masculine authenticity so bound up in, in violence, in a return to violence that you know they discover themselves through punching each other or – I mean it turns out it – discovers himself through punching himself in the face a bunch of times. But like that there's something, you know, one of the problems with modernity is that it has it stripped violence from our lives. Um, why do that which seems which seems very odd. Like the stripping of violence from our lives is almost by, you know, is by definition progress. Um, so is there or like why are we telling men that they necessarily in order to be real men have to be violent men? Well, I, I think it is progress. You're right. Uh, what we're freed from uh, is the uh, is the constant threat of, of of violent death. But evolution has equipped us to have to respond uh, to the uh, near constant threat of uh, violent death. Uh, there's a, a great book by a guy. I think his name is John, John Gottschall, uh, called The Professor in the Cage. Uh, where he, uh, he writes about – he's a, an adjunct English professor and he writes about uh, his experience of uh, training for mixed martial art fighting uh, and he does a lot of interpretation of literature through uh, an evolutionary lens and, and talking about men fighting uh, in literature from the Iliad and the Odyssey through Beowulf uh, up to the, uh, the present. And while I think it's great that we're stripped of the need to have to fight, uh, we're also uh, given some evolutionary endowment uh, to be inclined to fight or inclined to violence. And I think it's, uh, it has to find its, its safe outlet uh, as my dog has whatever uh, inclination to forage or, or hunt that uh, he can exercise in some limited form while he's out for a walk. Uh, most men uh, have an excess uh, of testosterone, at least compared to what's required uh, for decent life in civilized society these days and need to find some way to discharge it, whether it's through physical exercise or playing video games uh, or whatever the, the case may be. So in Fight Club, we, as we've been discussing, there's all these themes of anti-consumerism, maybe anti-anti-consumerism, authenticity, you know, and a bunch of different things. It's, it's definitely something worth both reading and watching. But what are some of the interesting things that you think that the, the movie forces us to ask or examine that, that you think not a lot of people realize? Well, advertising gets demonized uh, and in some ways – not rightly so, I think, right? Because advertising presents choices to us. And if we don't look at whether or not we want to endorse them, we can easily go along with them. One of the ways uh, in which I determine what to listen to on my iPod some days is to just flip through the, uh, the list of artists and, and let one of them pop into my head. And advertising will do that for you. And some people think, well, any, any consumer spending uh, is good for the economy. Uh, any spending is good spending. But I'm not really sure about that. I, th I think we have something like the emperor's new clothes uh, meets the broken window fallacy. Uh, listeners to this podcast will know that uh, a broken window uh, is not something that's a good stimulus for the economy any more than the uh, cash for clunkers scheme back uh, a few years ago was something that stimulated the economy. Uh, and I don't think that just any consumer spending is good for the economy uh, either, right? When uh, a, a kind of an idea or desire pops into your head simply as a result of advertising, uh, it really pays to stop and consider, hey, I've got this desire now, whether it's for the Cinnabon uh, or for the Budweiser or for the Chevy, do I really want to endorse that, right? Would my money not be better spent on something else, right? Uh, uh, we vote with our dollars, we vote with our consumer choices, and no more than I would want to kind of walk into the voting booth uh, and let somebody's uh, name and the, uh, uh, the kind of uh, nice sound of their name determine who I'm going to vote for, uh, should I want uh, the sound of an advertising jingle uh, determine where I'm going to put my dollars. I really need to reflect on the desire that I have as a result of the advertisement. 
Thanks for listening. This episode of Free Thoughts was produced by Tess Terrible and Evan Banks. To learn more, visit us at www.libertarianism.org.